Hello, welcome back to Math360. Today we are going to be moving on to consumer resource models, which are um, a really common form of model in mathematical biology um, because they represent uh, a wide range of uh, species interactions. So today we're going to be talking about the general framework um, and in particular how we can um, define um, things uh, called uh, functional responses and these describe uh, the rate of consumption of uh, a, a consumer uh, with a particular resource. Um, we'll be talking about things like attack time and uh, attack rates and handling time, sorry. Um, we've already talked about these in the context of the spruce budworm model. We'll be returning to these today. And then finally, we'll be spending a bit of time thinking about separation of time scales, um, which allows us to uh, derive a logistic growth model from a classic uh, consumer resource interaction. So recently we've focused on a uh, resource competition between the two species. Uh, this is where um, we have two species competing for a shared resource, say food, and the interactions between these species are negative, so they each reduce the growth rate of the other. We've also considered, for example, mutualism, where the interactions are both positive. Now we're going to think about consumer resource interactions that are asymmetric, and that means that the presence of one species is beneficial to the other, and the presence of the other species is um, detrimental to the other. So this is also known as an exploiter victim scenario. So essentially, while resources have a positive effect on consumers, consumers have a negative effect on resources. And for example, we might have um, things like predator-prey models fit this pattern. And that includes so plants and herbivores, plant herbivore interactions, and also infectious disease models. So host parasite, pathogen models also fit this paradigm where in this case, our parasite is our exploiter or our consumer and the host is a resource. Okay, so let's think about a schematic for a general consumer resource model. Well, we've got two species, resource which are called R and a consumer C. And we want to have some renewal of that resource. Now, use renewal in, the, in a very loose sense here. This could be um, uh, some sort of inflow or replenishment um, from some external factor, or it could be that resource renewing itself through reproduction. We also want to have consumption of that resource. So these resources are going to be essentially converted into biomass for our consumer. And I'll include this little dashed arrow here to indicate that the rate of consumption depends on the amount of consumers. And then we're also going to have death of our consumers as well. So this is our, our basic resource consumption model that takes this, this format. Okay, so we can write down some equations that correspond to this. Let's think about an equation for our resource, dr dt. Well, we want to have a, a renewal. So it's gonna be some function of our, our resource. We want to have consumption, I'll call this G. This is gonna be a function of the density of our consumer and our resource. And then our consumer, we're gonna have consumption again, G of C and R, but we're gonna assume that there's gonna be an efficiency uh, parameter as well here. And that tells us how well those resources are converted into biomass for our consumer. And then we had a death rate, which I'll call H of C. And this G of C, we're going to be focusing on quite a bit and thinking about what this functional response means. And this is essentially the rate of resource consumption. Okay, so this parameter E as well, I have sign on, I should say. Um, we can think about some sensible bands for this. Because this is an efficiency parameter, it's going to be dimensionless um, and it's telling us how good the consumer is at converting 
the resource into consumer biomass and therefore sensible grounds this has to go somewhere between zero and one in theory it could, we could model it as being perfectly um, efficient but so we could have this as less than or equals um, but generally we would want it to be between zero and one okay let's think about the renewal of our resource what functional forms we might uh, expect in this model. So let's think about just what happens if there are no consumers around. So this C is equal to zero, and that means that we reduce down back to a, a one dimensional system. So we've got dr dt, it's gonna be some function f of r. We've seen lots of models that look like this already. These are just our simple one dimensional models. So what does this renewal rate look like? Well, it could, for example, represent a constant inflow of resources. So this f of r is just some constant little r that's independent of the amount of resources already in the system. It's just constantly uh, flowing in. We could have a constant per capita growth rate of our resources. So this f of r, for example, could be r little r times by big R. And this is just exponential growth. Or we could have some sort of density dependent growth, for example, logistic growth, where there is now growth of our resource that starts off being exponential, but then is limited by some carrying capacity. So these might represent different scenarios. For example, um, the constant inflow could be uh, nutrients in a, a chemostat in the lab. Um, the per capita growth um, could be uh, a species that um, we never actually see any uh, density dependent effects on that species because it is kept in check by uh, a consumer. And the logistic growth, we might see um, these logistic growth curves, for example, in um, a variety of prey populations, say rabbits that might um, grow up to a carrying capacity, uh, and they also have some uh, predators around that will, will affect their growth. Okay, so this is the renewal of our resource. Now let's think about our consumer mortality. So we're thinking about the functions at the moment that, are in, that uh, don't involve any species interactions. So suppose there are no resources around, R is equal to zero. Well, that means our interaction term G of C and R is going to be equal to zero as well. And so our DC DT is just going to be minus H of C, where R H of C is our mortality rate. And this could be a couple of things again, we might expect there to be a constant per capita death rate. For example, H of C could equal some per capita death rate D times by the density of consumers, or it might be density dependent. So for example, we might have something that looks like this, D of C squared. These are just a couple of examples. We'll mainly be focusing on, on the first one. And finally, we need to think about the interaction between our consumers and our resources. And this is our functional response G of C and R. Now, so this is the rate at which our, our resources are being consumed. And there are, again, a, a variety of different uh, functional forms that we might be able to um, apply to this, depending on the scenario we're in. And there are three main ones that people focus on. These are known as Holling type one, two, and three functional responses. First is a, a linear rate. So this is a type one, type one. A linear rate of resource consumption looks like this. We have our, our consumption rate, our functional response G of C and R is just some constant A times by C times by R. So this is, is telling us the C R term is telling us uh, about the uh, rate at which um, consumers are coming into contact with resources. This rate goes up as there's more consumers or if there's more resources. And this parameter A we're gonna to refer to as our attack rate. So this is some uh, positive constant. Okay. Type two, here, this is where we have a saturating rate of resource consumption. So, this case here, we still have an attack rate A and our CR giving us our um, rate of uh, consumers coming into co contact with resources. But we're going to divide this by one plus AHR where H is handling time. So this is telling us that um, consumers can't just keep um, eating 
uh, resources, you know, if, if there's lots of a lot of resources around, um, it's going to reduce the rate at which they can be consumed. Um, so essentially, um, you know, predators, for example, need time to, uh, once they've killed their prey, they need time to eat that prey and then digest it. Uh, they don't just immediately keep killing um, um, prey um, at a very fast rate. So that's a saturating function. That's a type two functional response. And then type three response. So where our functional response here, G, is ACR to the power of K over one plus AHR to the power of K, where K is greater than one. So this one's a little bit harder to describe, but essentially a generalization of type two. So let's think about what these three different curves look like. We want to plot our consumption rate, our functional response against our amount of resources. I'm going to fix the C here and just focus on varying our resource density R. And let's think about our type one. Our type one, first of all, looks something like this. Okay, this is A times by C times by R. So that's this one here. So A and C are just constants in this particular example here. So we're fixing C as a constant. Uh, and so our type one response is linear. And it just looks like this. So here we have no saturation. Let's think about our two other um, functional responses here. If we fix our value of C, I'm just going to set C equal to one here to, for, for that loss of generality. We'll have something that looks like this, AR over one plus AHR. In fact, I'll do this for both type two and type three. So I'm going to assume here that my K could be equal to one in this particular case. I want to think about what is the limit of this as k gets very big. Well, we can divide through by r power of k as long as r is non zero. So we're going to have a over one over r to the k plus a h. And if we think about what happens as r gets very, very big, this first term, the one over r to the power of k, is going to tend towards zero. So we're going to have a over a h. So this is going to tend towards one over h as r tends towards infinity. So it tells me that my saturating. Uh, responses will tend towards some value 1 over h, h is our handling time, as r gets very big. So our type 2 response ends up looking something like this, where we start off close to that linear one, but then we saturate. So our type 2 response. So when the resources are very dense, when there's lots of resources around, because of this handling time, um, our, our consumer cannot keep increasing its uh, rate of resource consumption above some limit. It's constrained by the amount of consumers that are around. And then finally, our type three, which we've already met with our spruce budware model, looks something like this, where again, there's saturation at high densities, not the best of drawings, because it's a little bit hard to do on here. So our type three, we have saturation, just like with our type two response, but at low densities, our consumer switches to other prey. So this is basically saying, okay, when there's not much uh, of this particular resources around, uh, we, uh, our, our consumer will switch to some other form of resource. And this is what we see in our, our spruce puddle model. So we've already seen this functional form. There we, would, we were not modeling our bird population. We were treating it as being a constant. The difference here is we are now going to be modeling our consumer population as well. Okay, so we have our basic structure of this model and we can write down um, uh, an example here. So here we're going to consider a very simple consumer resource model uh, where we have a logistic renewal rate and um, a constant um, per capita death rate for our consumer, as well as a linear rate of resource consumption. So what does that look like? We're going to have DRDT 
is equal to, here we have the logistic growth. And then we have a linear functional response. And for our consumer, here our efficiency parameter, a linear functional response, and then a linear per capita um, death rate. Okay, we're assuming as well that all of these parameters are greater than zero. Okay, so why are we taking this, this particular model? Well, what I want to think about here is what happens if the dynamics of our resource are much, much faster than our dynamics of the consumer? In other words, the renewal of our resource is happening very, very fast and our, um, our resource dynamics equation, our DRDT, is such that this is approximately equal to zero. So the DRDT means that being approximately equal to zero means that it's essentially not changing. At any point in time we look at, we always go back to roughly the same level of resources. So our R is essentially constant. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use a, an idea of separation of time scale. So we're thinking of these resources being rapidly replenished and going back to their equilibrium while our consumer is changing relatively slowly. Okay, so let's think about what happens if we set the RDT equal to zero. Well, we're just going to focus on this, this one dimensional case essentially and uh, ignore our C, or, or our, we'll have our equilibrium population R as a function of C. So if DRDT is equal to zero, then we can just write our first equation in terms of our R stars. So our C is still featuring here, but we're assuming that the C is, is um, uh, changing very, very slowly. Okay, so this is, is equal to zero. So that means we can do a bit of rearranging. Just like before, we can see that either r star has to equal zero, or if we divide through by r star, we're gonna get r times by one minus r star over k minus ac must equal zero. We've just got one r star here, doing a little bit of algebra to rearrange this, and I'll write it as a function of c, just to make it clear that this is a function rather than a, um, a, a fixed value. Our equilibrium level of quasi-equilibrium level of resources is going to be equal to k times by one minus ac over r. This is just a, a rearranging of the equation above. Okay, so we now have our quasi-equilibrium level of resources as a function of our density of consumers C. So we can now take that and substitute that into our equation for C. So dc dt, if you recall, is gonna be equal to epsilon ac r, but we're now substituting in this value of r that's at quasi-equilibrium minus dc. So this is an equation we had all the way back up here, but we're assuming that this dr dt is always approximately equal to zero. It rapidly replenishes and the dynamics of our consumer are much slower. So whenever our value of c changes, our value of r rapidly changes so that it is um, roughly at equilibrium. So that means that we're gonna be able to substitute in this r star here into the equation below. Okay, so this is just a substitution now. So we have epsilon AC. Our R star is K times by one minus AC over R. And then we have our death rate for our consumer at the end. So what can we do now? Well, let's expand this all out first. So we have epsilon ACK minus epsilon KA squared c squared over r or minus dc at the end. So we can do a little bit of algebraic manipulation here. And notice that if we take out a factor of epsilon a k minus d, that deals with these linear terms at the front. So we can have our density of consumers multiplied by that. So those uh, first and last terms in our balance. 
we're now going to have one minus. So this is the, the one is telling us that we need to multiply out the epsilon on AK minus D times by C one time. We have a term, this uh, term here, which I will highlight in red. This term we need to account for here. So if we leave everything as it is, epsilon K A squared C, so we've lost uh, one of our C's to the outside now. Divide by R, now we've taken out this factor of epsilon A K minus D. So we need to include that here, epsilon A K minus D. So if you're eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that this here is just a constant. Epsilon, A, K, and D are just parameters. They're just numbers, so we can replace them with another parameter, which would be some other number. Likewise, if I circle all of these terms here, these are all just parameters as well, so they would be just numbers, and we can replace those with some other parameter, which will be equivalent to one number that is composed of all of these things together. So I could write this now as R tilde, just some other parameter, times by C, times by one minus C over K tilde, where R is equal to epsilon AK minus D and K tilde is equal to R epsilon AK minus D over epsilon K A squared. So those look kind of nasty, but it doesn't really matter. Like I said, they're just parameters. And so we can compose them all together into two other parameters, R tilde and K, K tilde. And you'll notice then that this here is just logistic growth for our consumer. And so what we've been able to show here is that if we start off with a two species consumer resource model of this form here, where we have some logistic replenishment of our resource, we have linear um, consumption of our resource by our consumer, and we assume that the dynamics of our resource are much, much faster than our dynamics of our consumer, then using this separation of timescales argument, we show that in that limit where our resource renews very, very quickly relative to our consumer, we can just model the consumer dynamics by standard logistic growth. And so our two species consumer model essentially collapses down to a one species logistic growth model in an approximation where our resource dynamics are fast. So this is another way of showing where our logistic growth model comes from in the simple one dimensional case, although we only um, you know, we have this abstract carrying capacity and growth rate. If we think about the, the resources that that species consumes, we can see that uh, our logistic growth model can be derived from a more complicated model. Okay, that's it for today. Next time we are going to be moving on to look at uh, simple predator prey models.